Um, I said in the last session, or I should go back a, a bit before, and it's been said, Rick said, will I be a discussant for a session? I said, of course. And then he said, the session on technology. And I said, that's not my session. So what do I know about technology and borders? Um, and I sat, th and I sat through the last session. I had this real sense of deja vu sitting here during the last two hours and thinking of where we've come in 20 years of border studies, starting with borderless worlds and flows and networks, and listening to a session which really described in detail, um, which really described in detail all the new technologies for surveillance, for control, for closing, for preventing movement of people. And it really has a sense of deja vu, but it's very important because it tells us, you know, maybe some of the questions we have to focus on today and some we should be looking at in the future, even if many of us come from what I would call, I wouldn't say a radical perspective, but a critical perspective, which questions the whole essence and existence of borders and what their functions and significances are in the world today. But nevertheless, um, they're very real out there today, but they're very real in a very different way. Um, and what I'd like to do in the 10, 15 minutes I've been given is I want to relate generally to the four papers. I'm not going to relate specifically to um, any of the detail, particularly as I'm not an expert in technology. The only thing I would say about that is that my own university, Ben Gurion University in the south of Israel, just a year ago set up a new research center called, guess what it's called? The Center for Homeland Security Studies. It's all to do with the hard sciences. They didn't come and speak to David Newman about knowing anything about borders. What they're interested in is working with all the big technology industries and the arms industries in how you can have better surveillance techniques, better drones, better robots. We have some very expert robot scholars. And so this is, of course, how the issue of borders is um, uh, perceived by so many people who aren't within this framework of sort of rethinking or reanalyzing border studies. Some of you know that when I come and give a, a presentation on generally on border studies, I like to show my caricatures. Um, some of you have seen them, as they say, ad nauseum. All I'm going to do here is I'm not going to talk about them at all. I've just picked three of them, which I'm going to flick through because they're all to do about borders and security. Um, which normally in the past has always been sort of an addendum, something peripheral to what mm. I've been saying about borders. It seems to have come back in in a very big way. And as I always say in past presentations, a caricature is there for everybody's personal interpretation. I don't analyze them, I don't interpret them. You can look at these three, I'll flick through the three of them, um, and you can, and of course it's very relevant to the anti-Atlas uh, idea of medias and representations. Some of you know I have a very large collection of border caricatures. I want to make three main comments, and they all relate to the issue of borders, technology, and ethics. And I want to ask some very important questions about the ethics of how we control and how we manage uh, borders today. What it seems to me has been happening is it's, it's a bit like a biological process. I have to be very careful here. I'll get into very dangerous water because we know where sometimes these biological comparisons with human behavior have led us in the past. But in a sense, when I think of 20 years of very intensive border studies in many different frameworks, you know, we started about 20 years ago with this whole notion of globalization, Borderless worlds, we, we, not we, but those, the sociologists in particular, took the argument of globalization a bit too far and argued that because of the flows and networks, we were getting totally into a world without borders. Um, we've passed through historical and political contingencies during that period, of which a very important one was, of course, 9-11 and the return of the securitization discourse, the recreation, the restructuration of borders. Yet borders are not the same today as they were. Yes, in some places there are new fences and there are new walls in order to keep the so-called threat, whatever that threat may be, 
It may be called terrorism, but in many cases it is called terrorism as a means of getting public support to prevent many other people or things coming in to the country beyond the borders. And what we've done is now we've developed a whole new technology to deal with borders in the contemporary era. So what we, in a sense, we have done is we have created a new human or biological balance, if you want. It's a different type of border, but it hasn't become an open border. Uh, the opening of borders, the greater intensity of flows and networking has meant that governments and human agency has now had to create new techniques which are in line with globalization. They themselves are part of globalization technology to deal with and to control those borders. And it's very possible, thinking back to virtually every one of those papers that was given in the past two hours, that today there are far more sophisticated technologies um, which control and manage the border than there ever were at the time when there was a world of closed and sealed borders in the very traditional sense 30, 40, and 50 years ago. Um, I, you know, the, the idea that the border is not necessarily located at the border is, of course, a very important anti-atlas or agiographical uh, concept to the extent that, of course, in many senses, the border is located, the border to the United States of America um, is located in the middle of airports everywhere else around the world except for in America itself. If you come to Heathrow or you come somewhere else and you are checked there by the federal agents and you don't have the right passport or the right ticket, you don't gain access to the United States of America, but you don't gain access 5,000 miles away, not necessarily when you reach the actual land of the United States of America. And I can well imagine, I was discussing this over coffee just now, I can well imagine maybe it's already happening and we don't know about it, but if it's not happening yet, I can well imagine a situation where someone sitting behind a computer in Washington, D.C., hooked in by a very sophisticated Skype-type technology to what's happening in the middle of the airport in London or Paris or, or Johannesburg or wherever, and giving the order from there whether this person can be allowed in based on technological, uh, bio um, uh, features, and even just looking through with Skype at how the person looks and what, he, what his answers are and what his accent is. So in a sense, we have a very closed border technology, but it's a very aspatial or very a-geographical uh, one. Of course, it raises a number of very important ethical issues, and the one ethical issue which I think is very important is not just a question of uh, how we control and how we manage and how we treat people, particularly um, as the so-called illegal migrant workers from the third world whose skin color is different, who don't have the language, who don't have the documents, and what we do with them at borders in physical terms, put them in detention centers, um, etc. There was a very interesting case in Israel just two weeks ago where, um, forget the security issues, some of you may or may not know, there was until a few, uh, there has been recently a big flow of um, migrant labor from Somalia and Ethiopia through the Sinai Desert and over the Israel-Egypt border, at least those who make it without being exploited or killed on the way. And the Israeli government um, took it upon itself without consulting anyone to have some very draconian measures where they could just round these people up and put them in detention for up to about three months without even charging them or, or, or even in long-term centers for up to two years before expelling them. And actually a high court decision two weeks ago overruled that, that and said it was um, illegal and it was anti-democratic. And in the last two or three weeks they've had to release a lot of these people from detention centers. And now of course the government, who as you know is not exactly the uh, uh, greatest left of center government, I'm using a British understatement to say that, um, uh, has now said, well, we have to now create new legislation to ensure that these people don't uh, stay in the country and cross the border anymore. But the bigger ethical issue, which I think is very interesting and arises out of the last session, is what, if any, is less or more ethical, less or more humane? I'm tending to uh, mix these words, humane and ethics. Um, and that is, is personal profiling or is technological profiling more or less ethical? Until about two years ago, the argument was um, technology at least is something 
neutral, it's divorced, it's remote from the individual. And there was a tremendous amount of criticism. If any of you have been to Israel, you know that uh, Israel doesn't or traditionally has not used the technological aspects of people coming in. It's very much been focused on the issue of personal profiling, um, asking a lot of questions, um, uh, taking people aside and saying, um, you know, you've been invited to a conference. Um, can I see the conference paper? Are oh, you visited the West Bank? Who did you meet there? And very focused, and it's very uh, not very pleasant in some cases. Um, and it's very much based on personal profiling. There's been a tremendous amount of criticism of that uh, policy because it says it's based very much on personal preferences. These people are told, you know, someone who has been too much to the Middle East, too much to the Arab world, doesn't have the right background. These are people that maybe will or will not be allowed into the country or will be given a very rough and tough time um, at the airport and so on. And this is too much based on personal selection processes. And I don't need to tell you the minute the concept of personal selection is thrown into the public discourse in Israel, it raises all sorts of historical um, uh, issues and contexts. And what they argue is, so the Israeli response has always been to argue, ah, well, it may or may not be more ethical, but it works. It works because we have a very secure airport system and people feel safe going through um, uh, uh, and so on. But then listening to everything that was in the last session about technology and the way that technology now intrudes to a far greater extent than ever before in terms of facial features, in terms of fingerprints, um, in terms of a lot of the personal profiling that was done by people but is now fed into computers um, and the question that someone can sit in an unseen office, you don't see him, but he sees what is happening to you when your whole body is scanned as you come through the air, as you come through these uh, sort of horrible little machines which scan you, um, then the question of what exactly is more or less ethical, that in itself is a problematic question. Are either of them ethical? And where do, of course, the classic question, which we know from countries around the world, when we focus on securitization discourse, um, countries will often argue that ethics don't even play a role there because what is important for public safety goes beyond ethics, goes beyond humane dealing of people and treatment of people and so on. And that's, of course, the argument which has come back in in a very big way in the past 10 years, securitization, securitization. Even in democratic societies, Western Europe, let's call, uh, you can sell the safety argument. We have a threat. That threat is called global terrorism. Um, if we don't close down the borders, if we don't uh, profile people, if we don't question them intensely, then maybe the terrorist is going to get through. And would you want to take the responsibility of having, um, because of being more liberal in our laws, of allowing that terrorist to get through? I'm always reminded, and some of you have heard me say this before, at a border conference in Las Cruces about six or seven years ago, we had a meeting together with people of Homeland Security of the United States. Um, and um, along came a guy from Washington, and he said, you academics, you talk about uh, globalization, you talk about open borders. He says, I'll tell you how we in the Homeland Security view the USA-Mexico um, uh, border. We see um, every one of a million Mexicans who cross the border on a weekly basis as a potential terrorist unless proven otherwise. In other words, the default situation is you are a threat and if, as in one of the slides it showed, you aren't a hit, how was it put on the slide? You aren't a hit. In other words, the hit is the default situation. Not being a hit is okay. You can come through. And that is, of course, how the thinking goes. And in that sort of thinking, ethics doesn't really play a very big role. Let me just um, conclude my comments by a few personal anecdotes about crossing borders in situations of intense security. And here I come back to where I live most of the time in Israel, um, just a few kilometers south of what is the separation, security, barrier, fence, wall, whatever you want to call it. First of all, when I go in and out of Israel, I use a little credit type card. I flick it through a machine, put my hand down. I've been using it for six or seven years. It identifies me immediately. I'm a good guy. I can go straight through. I mean, that's not the security check. The security check is different, but that's sort of going through customs. When this card first came into operation, many of us put up a bit of a fight against using it. Why? 
because the technology had been created, um, this was before the withdrawal from Gaza, um, the technology had been created to check Palestinians coming in from Gaza to Israel in and out every day, and it had proved very effective. And so it was put into use at all of Israeli airports, and of course all the great liberals amongst us we held out for a year, we held out for two years. One day we were running for a plane, we got caught up in a big queue because there was a crush on the, there was a huge amount of people waiting for their planes. We nearly mixed their planes, we got very annoyed, and the next time we all went and signed up, you know, for the finger card, um, et cetera. Ethics, big ethical question here, it goes without saying. I live three kilometers south of the Green Line. Um, I go to Jerusalem at least twice a week to visit my mother, to visit my kids, to, for other university business. I have two options. I can either turn right and go straight through the West Bank, which means crossing two borders, going into the occupied territories and out of the occupied territories, but it's only 70 kilometers, or I can drive around, which is uh, 120 kilometers on much busier roads. Um, most people don't go through the West Bank, mostly for, because they fear for their safety. Israel controls the West Bank, but actually, in effect, is controlled by the West Bank. And unless you're a right-wing settler, you don't on the whole drive through the West Bank. Crazy David sometimes goes through the West Bank uh, to see what's going on, to get there quickly. How do you go through the new border, the separation fence between Israel and the West Bank? There are three options. If you're a Palestinian, you don't cross the border unless you have a work permit. And even if you have a work permit, you're never allowed to bring your car across the border. And you can tell the difference between Palestinian and Israeli cars because they have different types of license plate, number plate. If you're an Israeli citizen, there are two types of crossing the border. If as you, it's all based on personal profiling. If as you're going through, you look a bit suspicious. Maybe you're an Arab citizen of Israel, um, you're asked questions, you're asked to show your documents. Often they ask to check, uh, they check to see what's in the, ba in the baggage to make sure you're not sort of uh, um, taking across what they would term as contraband. I think Cedric knows a lot more about that than I do, about what is smuggled over the, the West Bank border. And if you're a regular guy, it doesn't matter whether you're right wing or left wing, that's got nothing to do with it, but if you're a regular guy, um, and you come up to the border post and they say, ah, um, they say in Hebrew, shalom, how are you, how are you today? And you answer in what look, feels like a regular Israeli accent, great, everything's okay, and you look the right thing, up goes the barrier, and through you go. So there are three very different ways of crossing this very same border, and of course they raise very important ethical questions. And may I just end with an anecdote that happened two weeks ago um, to a neighbor of mine, which also sometimes shows the stupidity of technology at borders. Um, I have some neighbors, uh, a couple in their 40s, uh, with a large number of children. They're religious. They, I think they have about six children, all under the age of 10. And they're going to Boston for two years because he's just qualified as a GP, and he's going to specialize in one of the hospitals in Boston. Um, he went a bit earlier, leaving his wife the pleasure of going in by herself with all six kids via Istanbul, for whatever reason, obviously cheaper. They all took out visas for America. No one noticed there was a little mistake as they left Israel. That was the first mistake. When they got to Istanbul, so the American on the borders looked at the six passports and saw that five of them had the visa until July 2014, and one said July 2013. It was an obvious mistake because all the passports had been issued for the first time in the same American embassy on the same day. Obviously, on the sixth passport, the guy had written in the number three and four by mistake. They would not let this child go to United States of America, even when they phoned back to Israel and they said it was a mistake. They would, and in the end, she had to send five kids unaccompanied to America, and she had to fly from Istanbul back to Tel Aviv, go the next morning to the American, the American consulate in Istanbul wouldn't deal with it, and to get a new visa issued so that two hours later she could do the whole trek again and go back via Istanbul to the United States of America, something went wrong with the technology, with the very simple technology, um, and it may be a, a bit of a stupid story, but I think it says something of the absurdity sometimes of what's happening with borders today and who's leading
the game in border technology, um, and I think the answer goes unsaid. There are obviously very big ethical questions involved with this whole new securitization discourse and crossing borders, and what's happening is that we are using technology as a means, in a sense, of avoiding some of the very hard ethical questions, because we're saying, this is a machine, this is a robot, this is a computer, but of course, somebody likes us feeds in the profiling information in the first place. Thank you.